Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we are in round 13 of our coverage of the 2016 Candidates Tournament. Winner of this tournament does go on to face Magnus Carlsen in November for the World Championships. We're going to go over two things today. One is we have a match between Topolov and Nakamura. After that, we're going to go over round 14 preview and talk about who can actually win this tournament. Both of the competitors today, although an exciting match, none of them can win this tournament. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into it. Topolov playing the white pieces, probably having one of the worst tournaments he's had in a long time. Nakamura playing the black pieces, got out to a rough start in the tournament. Towards the back half of the tournament, he has played extremely well. He was my Pre-tournament favorite to win. Unfortunately for him, he will not be winning. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. Pawn to d4. Knight f6, pawn c4, pawn e6, knight f3, and then pawn d5. Getting into the queen's gambit decline lines. Toblov continues, knight c3, a bishop e7, a bishop f4. Always like to get the dark square bishop involved before the pawn to e3, just solidifying that pawn chain, blocking the dark square bishop out. Castle on the king side, uh, pawn to a3, and then pawn down here to c5. We do see an exchange on board, bring the bishop down here to c5. I, I like this exchange for black. Uh, black still has two central pawns, and he does have a very aggressive dark square bishop right here. Pawn to e3, just solidifying this pawn chain right here. Knight to c6, just developing a little bit. Pawn takes on d5, pawn recaptures, and then pawn up here to b4. Now, almost always you're going to see one of two moves. Bishop back here to b6, and then bishop to d6. These are the most common. We've kind of seen these for a long time in this particular line of the Queen's Game of Decline. But Nakamura kind of brought a novelty to this opening. It, it caught Topolov by surprise. Uh, if you kind of watched uh, this match, uh, even the commentators were impressed by this move. It is pawn to d4, uh, and it, it puts a little bit of strain on White as far as how he continues. He doesn't just want to take right here on c5 and just allow this pawn here on c3 to just do a lot of work. So that's going to be bad. Uh, instead, he decides to go ahead and take with this pawn. I think it's probably best if Topolov plays knight to a4 here, but still somewhat awkward, uh, but decides to go ahead and take with his pawn right here, uh, and then the bishop recaptures. Now, this bishop is pretty safe. It has knight with protection. It has the queen protection right here. It's just completely all up in white's business right here. So, decides to go ahead and take it with his knight, and then knight recaptures, and then the bishop back here to e3. Probably a little bit better uh, than taking with the knights and then the queen coming down here and capturing here on d4. Uh, after the queen takes, knight takes here on d4, castle on the queen side. Uh, this is probably better for white. Once the queens come off the board, you don't have to worry as much about your king being exposed. Uh, and this is pretty aggressive uh, from white. And so Nakamura looked at this and said, okay, I don't necessarily want to go down that line. So instead of taking with the queen right here, decides to go ahead and take with the knight and just have that protection back here with his queen. Now this bishop's going to attack the knight. Uh, decides to go ahead and bring it back here to f5, uh, and then we see the queens come off the board. We now see Tofalov play bishop e2. Knight takes on a3 after the pawn recaptures. White now has an isolated pawn on the e-file. So Nakamura, his plan a, his plan b, and plan c are all to attack this pawn right here on e3. Uh, and Toplov pretty much, he's just trying to stay aggressive. He doesn't want to spend all his material just protecting the pawn. Uh, so that's kind of his game plan as well. Knight to g4, immediately starts to attack the pawn. Pawn to e4, really the only way to kind of defend that. Uh, Bishop e6, just getting involved into the game. Castle on the king side. Knight to e3, attacking the rook. Rook to c1. And then rook down here to d2. So Nakamura doing a good job of being aggressive. Anytime you can get your rooks to your opponent's second rank, so for white that would be the seventh rank, for black that would be the second rank, uh, it's very, very powerful. You usually can get behind a lot of pawns or attack pawns that are already there, uh, and so it's definitely good, especially if you can get two rooks involved into the game. They can kind of support each other in the game. Uh, so right now the rook is threatening this bishop. The bishop moves to e or to f3. Uh, this is supporting the square here on g2, which is being attacked by both the knight and the rook. It's very, very powerful, and it's defending the square here on e4. Rook over here, d8, uh, and then pawn to e5. This is kind of tricky. It does have a discovered attack. The bishop is now attacking the square here on b7, uh, but no longer can this light square bishop defend this pawn on e5. So Nakamura, He's going to continue to just chip away and try to attack the square here on e5. But first, 
plays pawn to b6, wants to make sure his bishop, or this bishop here on f3 is not attacking that. Uh, and then knight to e4, rook to b2, a rook to e1, attacking the knight. The knight comes back to c4, attacking this pawn on e5. And then the knight's almost forced to move so that the rook can kind of protect this. Uh, after pawn to h6, we do see an exchange on board. So we do have a double isolated pawns right here. So Toplav is going to be looking to attack this pawn on e6. Nakamura on the other side is going to be looking to get his other rook involved, maybe to the second rank, and start to attack this square here on e5. Rook to c1, attacking the knight. Uh, now the rook's going to come down here to d4. Wants to maintain control of the knight here on c4. And so it decides to go and play pretty aggressive. Rook here to d4. Black's pretty good about keeping most of his material, especially his powerful pieces, on these dark squares. So these light square bishops can't really do much harm. Pawn to h3. Pawn to b5, just solidifying this outpost here. So the rook can kind of maneuver. It can come over here to f4 if it wants to. Put a lot of pressure on board without having to really control uh, the knight with the rook. It's kind of free to roam. It can also come down to the second rank if it wants to. Rook up here to c3. Uh, and then rook down here to d2. So now this bishop on f3 is forced to stay on this light square diagonal because it has to protect this square here on g2 from these double rooks. Pawn to a4, pawn to a6, and then bishop back here to b6, or b7. Knight to b6, and then pawn takes on b5. And this is one of those where the bishop, as we talked about, can't really come to a6, because then just knight to g2. This is pretty tough to deal with. Uh, king to h1, all of a sudden white's going to be down in material because of this. He has a pass pawn that's going to be very difficult for white to deal with. Uh, all in all, this is going to be a tough road for Toplov. So uh, he decides to go ahead and take with his pawn. And after the pawn recaptures, now bishop back here to e4, just solidifying the central of the board. Uh, but then knight to c4, threatening this pawn right here on e5, looking to go up material on board. Now rook to g3, uh, rook over here to e2, uh, and it's kind of interesting. I think Toblov should in this pos position just look to exchange on board. Rook takes on e2. We see an exchange. Starts to get some of that material on board. Bishop back here to c6. We do see the rook take. Uh, but then rook here to f3. Uh, although black is up mid-material, I do think white can maybe hold on for a tie in this position. Uh, after the rook came here to e2, unfortunately, Toplov made a pretty big blunder and played rook here to a1. It's just a little bit late on board. He could have played it a few moves earlier to start to get involved, attack on uh, the queen side, uh, but unfortunately it's just too late. The knight's going to take here on e5, and after the rook to a8, king to f7, uh, he can chase as much as he wants to. Unfortunately, it's just not going to be enough. Bishop here to, to h7, pawn down here to g5, bishop g8, King down here, f6. There's just not enough material on board. This knight on e5 just does so well protecting this square here on f3, where the rook would really like to come to. Uh, rook over here, f8. King back here to a g7. Rook e8, knight g6. After the bishop takes, then knight to f4. And this is kind of the dagger right here. One of these pieces is going to fall. If the bishop does fall, then the, the rook is going to fall. Uh, this is just going to be all sorts of, of badness. Uh, you know, the rook can even get involved if he wants to. Uh, so many bad things that can happen here. This position, Topolov was forced to resign. So congratulations to Nakamura for a hard-fought victory, uh, trying to go out of this tournament above winning percentage, uh, which it didn't look like he was going to uh, early on. So congratulations to him. Toplov having just a terrible tournament. Five losses so far uh, through 13 rounds is definitely uh, one of the worst he's had in a long time. But uh, more importantly, we have an epic last round coming up. So we had two matches today. Both go past 100 moves. So we had Fabiano Carjuana paying Peter Fiedler, uh, and it looked like Fabiano had a winning position. Now, it was a rook and bishop versus rook in game. Uh, if you kind of looked at the, the computer analysis and the grandmasters kind of going over their coverage, it went from Fabiano was had a potential mating to all of a sudden it's even, but it didn't really look like Fabiano made any mistakes. It was an extremely long and tough in game. Uh, all in all, I don't think Fabiano could have won, uh, but... It was an epic match. Fabiano tied his game. 
Sergey Kardiakin and Levan Aronian, they went past 100 moves as well. They ended up tying, uh, which means that tomorrow we have Sergey Kardiakin and we have Fabiano Caruana. They're both tied in first place, and lo and behold, as fate has it, they actually played together in round 14. Now, this is not because they were in first place. It just so happens that they already had the schedule. They were destined to play in the final round. Now, Vishian 9 is a half a point behind both of them, but he cannot win the tournament. So we'll kind of run through and we'll, we'll talk about this more tomorrow. If either player wins tomorrow, Sergei uh, or Fabiano, if one of them wins, they will go on to win the, the tournament. That That's probably obvious. If they tie... Uh, then by default, Sergei Kardiakin will win because he has more wins in the tournament. But there's a caveat. If Anon wins his match tomorrow, I know this gets somewhat confusing, but if Anon wins his game tomorrow, he plays, he plays Peter's Fiddler. He is playing the Black Pieces, so it's going to be tough. But if Anon wins with the Black Pieces and Sergei and Fabiano tie, then Fabiano will actually get the tiebreaker. Uh, it will be a three-way tie up top with Anon, Fabiano, and Sergei uh, in an a non, or excuse me, Fabiano has the best tiebreaker because he kind of beat up on a non. So, all in all, if you're hoping uh, for an American to win this to play Magnus Carlsen, you're one just hoping for Fabiano to win. Uh, if he doesn't win, then you really are hoping that a non wins tomorrow. Because then a tie would give Fabiano uh, the victory. All in all, though, uh, there's only two players that can win this tournament. So, Sergei or Fabiano after tomorrow will be the champion. Uh, so, Sergei is going to be playing the white pieces. Fabiano is going to be playing the black pieces. It's going to be epic. That is going to be the match that we will cover. Uh, win, lose, or draw. So be looking forward to that. If you can, I think it would be really cool not to have any spoilers. Uh, just watch the match tomorrow, the replay, uh, and we will try to disguise the winner as much as possible. But that's going to be epic. Make sure you check that out tomorrow. But everyone, say, thanks so much for watching. After 13 rounds, it's been a pretty epic tournament. Can't wait for round 14. See you guys tomorrow.